well, last week, we reached the climax. We reached the crescendo of John's gospel, all the way he's been building up this question of who is Jesus. And he finally reaches this climax that Thomas declares and that Jesus affirms Jesus is God, my Lord and my God. And then John, the writer of the gospel, immediately after that, he's come to this climax and straight after that, he turns around and says, do you know something, readers of my gospel, do you know something? Thomas believed it and I've given you enough evidence that you can believe it too. And that's where we pick it up this week in John 20, verse 30. This is straight after Jesus is declared as God. And then verse 30, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So he's saying, I could have given you a whole lot more. I had a lot more information, a lot more things that Jesus did I could have told you about. I've given you enough that you can believe. I've given you enough evidence that you can know this is true. Now, how can he say, that's a bold statement. How can he say such a bold thing that that anyone who reads John's Gospel has actually got enough information that they can believe? Which, which gospel should you be giving unbelievers to? John has said, I've given enough information that you can believe. How can he be so bold? Well, for the same reason that Jesus here challenges Thomas to stop doubting. Stop doubting. Uh, now, it's not that doubting itself or questioning, asking questions. Have you ever got questions Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. The Lord is not against people wanting to know answers to questions and, and getting you know, genuine uh, questioning. But <clears throat> what Jesus is rebuking Thomas about when he says stop doubting, he says it as though you really had no excuse for doubting. You really could have believed without seeing. Because scepticism is fine up to a degree if you're willing to be honest and consistent with the conclusions of your scepticism. Like Thomas. Now the disciples had actually told Thomas one week earlier, we read it in verse 25, we have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. So what are you saying, Thomas? Are you saying that your own friends are now all gone nuts or they're all, uh, you know, you're just trying to scam you or something. They're a bunch of, they've turned into lies. You've travelled with them for three years. You've gone through life and death situations. And now these same friends of yours who just before were these cowards, who just before were these sceptics themselves, and now they're telling you to your face, we've seen the Lord. What are you saying? What, you're a bunch of liars? What excuse have you got, let's go further, Thomas. Are you saying that Jesus was lying because he's the one who told you, Thomas, along with all the others, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. So what are you saying, Thomas? That they're all lying? They're all crazy? What motive would they have? All the disciples were doing in telling you that we've seen the Lord, is saying, testifying to exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. It turns out he's exactly who he said he was and he's proven it. Why are you doubting? See, even if you don't believe the Bible is the word of God, you can't just ignore history. Jesus entered into history publicly. You can't erase that. Uh, we've got more historical evidence for Jesus, his teaching, his claim to be God than any other person or event in all of ancient history, by far, by far. 
the documents are in far greater, astronomically greater supply, much closer to the time of the person and event than any other person or event in the history of the world before printing came in in 1483, 1484, somewhere around there. So when you hear people saying, and you might have heard this, and if you don't, you probably will at some point, yeah, yeah, you Christians, you got, you believe in all your stuff about Jesus, but I'm more interested in the real historical Jesus. Now, when someone says that, what do you say to them? Well, you've got to ask them this question. And when you say the real historical Jesus, what, what are your sources to find historical Jesus? I actually had that conversation with someone in the neighbourhood, one of the guys I met in the door knocking, and, and he, he said, you know, I, I've studied theology and the scholars were in search of the historical Jesus, not the stuff that you guys believe in, but who's the real Jesus behind in history? And I asked him that question. I said, so what sources were your scholars using to find this historical Jesus? And you know what You know what the sources are? The same one you've got when you open your Bible. That's, that's what they use. That's what they use. But they take the bits that they want Right to make up the hist- the Jesus they would like to have of history and leave out those uncomfortable bits like my Lord and my God. We won't have that bit. Right? There was a famous Jesus seminar. Uh, it would go on every year in America where these scholars would gather together to discover the historical Jesus. And they, which sources, what documents are they using to discover the... Same one you got, open up in your New Testament. So that what they would do is they'd go through the New Testament, the Gospels, and they would put up a um, text of Scripture and each of the scholars would have a, a black slip and a pink slip and they spent, depending on whether they thought this one, they'd look at the text and go, no, nah, we don't think that would be historical. they put up the black slip or pink slip or whatever. Ah, that's a, a sentence is too long. There was an oral tradition. No, no, out, you know or anything they didn't like, but they were using the same document that you've got, the, the New Testament, that, and there is no historical evidence to try and separate it into bits. This is just deciding which bits we like and which bits we don't like. Well, people are not unbiased when it comes to looking at this question of who is the historical Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus' life and teaching as we've been looking at it and we, we have noted on the way through John's Gospel that important things were mentioned by people outside the Bible, by the Romans, by the Jewish historians and none of them contradict anything it's actually in the text of Scripture, but confirm key elements, in fact. Well, <clears throat> John is saying, if you're willing to deal honestly with the history that you have got, you've got enough evidence to be able to believe. You know, the big deal of this text where, where we, we're looking at Thomas the Doubter. You know what the big deal is? I, I, I know what a lot of people think the big deal is. The doubters go, hey, look at this. Thomas was a doubter, so can't blame me. I'm a doubter too. And they think that's what the big deal out of this is. That's not what the big deal of this text is. The big deal is that the most clear profound declaration in history that Jesus is God was made by a doubter. You've got no excuse because it's the doubter who said this. It was first declared by a skeptic. 
even the most famous doubter was transformed from a, 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 a skeptic, a coward, into an unstoppable force declaring that Jesus is risen. The only way you can be honest and consistent with scepticism is to believe, therefore, that Jesus and these men were all in on a conspiracy to give their lives to those torturous deaths we looked at in order to commit a fraud, a lie, just to keep a lie going, we're going to die. We've looked at it before and I, I've said that there is no precedent in history where this many people would be willing to die for something they didn't believe in because if Jesus didn't rise, they, would, they, wouldn't, they knew it. No precedent in the history of the world. And that's the logical conclusion of scepticism that they must have been, Jesus and his followers, were conspiring and going to give up their lives for something they knew was not true. Thomas, this sceptic, this doubter, later becomes a missionary to well, modern-day Iran, but especially India. Uh, the, the church in India is at its strongest in southern India. And I met people who are members of the church that have their roots and origin back to the Apostle Thomas. Now this doubter was gone from doubting and scepticism to being ready to give his life. And in fact, in the 60 AD 60s, Thomas was executed by a spear thrust because he would not deny Jesus as my Lord and my God. This is the doubter. This is the sceptic. This is the one who was on the side of scepticism. Why would he be ready to give his life unless he truly knew and had seen Jesus? and believed in him as my Lord and my God. And the only answer is because it's true. He really had seen Jesus. But we need to, to, to John is throwing this challenge out, saying, I've got enough evidence for you to believe. But unbelief is not neutral ground. Well, you can't blame me. I'm a doubter. Just like Thomas, I sit on the fence. You know, Sitting on the fence is actually not neutral. It's attacking Jesus. What do I mean? Well, it's in the face of these words in our text, my Lord and my God and Jesus affirming them. If you're doubting, then you've got to be saying that Jesus was lying or, or crazy or something. Um, you're saying it's at least possible. Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'm not sure. Well, then you're saying it's possible that Jesus is a lie. You're actually entering that as a, as a possibility. There isn't any neutral ground. There isn't any, you're either passively or actively attacking Jesus just by sitting on the fence. No, you're actually saying it's at least possible that he was some crazy lunatic or, you know, not many, not many of the, uh, skeptics are willing to consciously follow through with their with the logic of what they're saying. Even even aggressive anti-Christian, you know, kind of people like Richard Dawkins will refuse to confront the logic. Jesus is claiming, "My Lord and my God." And, and, and what does Dawkins do with that? Oh, I don't go along with that Lord, liar, lunatic thing. No, 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 no. Jesus was just honestly mistaken. Now, I reckon this guy, Richard Dawkins, pretty educated man, but it just shows there's something in the heart that stops up even the brain because if someone, anyone, falsely, Wrongly, mistakenly, thinks 
that they are the God who created this whole universe exclusively. And he's saying, no, no, that's not someone who's a liar. That's not someone who's, who's crazy. He's just honestly mistaken. You think you created the world? You think you're the God who created the world? And you, no, no, I think Richard Dawkins is mistaken. And I don't think it's honestly. Because if you're willing to be truthful with the logic, and, and this is what John is actually throwing out at us. He's trying to say, just be honest with what you've got before your eyes. You have to look at, at this, stare this in the face with Thomas saying it and Jesus affirming it, that he is God, not just any God. We've looked at it before. The God who created this world. Be honest with the conclusion. If you're willing to doubt, you've got to go further than just saying someone who thought they created the world. The people who think they created the world are in asylums. You know, That's the kind of person who gets that wrong. They're not just sincere, honestly mistaken. They've got to be, and this is why people like Dawkins don't want to press the logic. They don't want to be saying Jesus is a liar or a lunatic because, well, I mean, it just doesn't fit the facts and it doesn't sound very cool. Even unbelievers don't want to call Jesus that. But they don't want to press it because the alternative, the only alternative, is not honestly mistaken. The only alternative is Jesus is God, my Lord and my God. And that's why John is so cocky here, saying, I've given you enough evidence for you to be able to believe. You've got no excuse. The trouble is it's not an intellectual exercise. In our natural selves, we don't want to submit to Jesus. We want to be like those scholars with the pink slip. I'll have this bit, but I don't want that bit. I like this stuff over here, but I don't like that. In the natural heart, if anyone and only by the grace of God our hearts are opened, we'll find that there is plenty of evidence that Jesus is my Lord and my God. So what does the climax of this gospel tell us? This journey, the lives of the disciples and Jesus' ministry, that we've, we've seen their struggles, we've seen them go through ups and downs, we've seen them encounter enemies, antagonism, people who claim to be believers and are not. We've seen them uh, encounter the opposition from the religious establishment, the, the chief priests and the Pharisees trying to attack and and... What's more, these same people, these same religious leaders actually saw the miracles of Jesus. We've seen that in John's Gospel. So what's that telling? John's first, particularly his Jewish readers, were asking later in the first century when this Gospel is circulating, the, they were asking this one question. If there's all this stuff, there's all this evidence, then how come our fathers and our grandfathers didn't believe it? How come the chief priests, the, the religious leaders, didn't believe it? What's wrong with them? By the time they get to the end of this gospel, they know the answer. It's got nothing to do with evidence. It's back to, I want to hold up the pick slip, I don't like that bit. I don't like that bit about Jesus. What John has shown in this gospel that those religious leaders, in fact, anybody, when you want to be the Lord of your own life, when you refuse to give up the crown, take it off your head and place it on Jesus' head, when there's part of your life that you want to be Lord, you'll find any excuse You'll go in search of another historical Jesus. You'll come up with crazy ideas. Jesus was just honestly mistaken. You'll come up with anything. 
And John shows, <clears throat> he's taken us through this journey of the disciples through rejection, through pain, through persecution, and fleeing, finally, at, at, at when Jesus arrested. He's taken us through their dejection when things didn't work out and it turns out to have a, have a, a triumphant ending better than any Hollywood movie could come up with. Jesus is risen and he's taken us and the disciples through this and what did the disciples, what have they discovered now? This one we walked with, we travelled with, we slept out under the stars, we ate with, we listened to his teaching. He was our rabbi and it turns out he was God come to be with us. God himself had come to visit us. And this is both terrifying and exhilarating. God with us? How'd you be if God's walking around with you all the time? And then you think, hang on, that was God with me. You think back about how I talked, how I walked, what I did. Thomas had been complaining a week earlier Unless I can touch the marks in his side and his hands and so on, I will not believe it. And then a week later, what happened in our text? Jesus appears through the wall and says what? So, uh, Thomas, you want to um, touch the marks and so on? He must have been absolutely... Shocked. Not just because Jesus appears through the wall and yes, it's him and yes, he's God and he cries out, my Lord, my God. Not just because of who he is, but wait a minute. He just said something about something I said a week ago. How did he hear that? Is he just on the other side of the wall all the time? He can hear he was listening. I thought, I'm, I'm just saying this to the guys, you know, unless I see the thing. And he was actually listening. Now he's repeating it back to me. No wonder Thomas is so in awe that he doesn't take up Jesus' offer to actually touch him inside. He just falls at his feet and says, my Lord and my God. What does that tell us? What is it telling Thomas? It tells us the spiritual world is not some out there beyond Pluto place. The Lord is right here, behind the wall. By his spirit, he's here. He's not in some distant place. When when you pray, you know, you seeking the Lord in prayer, and he's way up there, right? No, he's right there with you. By spirit, he's right there with you. Think about that when you when you're praying this week. You know, you've got this picture of of Jesus on the other side of Pluto somewhere. No, he's right there in the room. Right there. If you have a part of your life that's secret that you don't want God, you know, you've got the pink slip up for this part. If you've got an area that you're keeping secret from everyone, just hidden away, maybe inside here, no one can see, Jesus is right there. He's right on the other side of the wall watching. What about when you're talking, whether it's at work or family or certain, uh, certain people you feel, you know, you let your guard down a bit and you're speaking in a certain way that you wouldn't want anyone else to hear. Right behind the wall, Jesus is right there listening to every word and the way you're saying it. He's there. This is the real Jesus of history. 
He's the God who created this universe and he's everywhere by his spirit. And he will do exactly what he said he did. And you know what it's going to be? It's going to be just like Thomas. You're going to see him face to face. Face to face. That's our destiny. That's our future. To see what Thomas saw. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my God. That he is God. Well, not everyone will be saying He's my Lord and my God. But he, everyone will be confessing that he's Lord. And for many, well, God willing for all of us, it will be a time of jubilation and awe. If you found that life in him, forgiveness in him by believing in his name, believing in what he did to go to that cross, to take away your sin, to restore relationship with, with him you, that you will have forgiveness and life in you. But it will be a time of terror for those who have said, no thanks, don't want the forgiveness. I was talking to someone who said, I prefer Buddhism where you know each person has to receive the penalty for themselves. It's none of this you know, swapping over substitution. Each one is on their own. That's great. But if you reject forgiveness, you won't be able to complain in the next life when you come face to face as Thomas did. So we have a message for the world that there is forgiveness, that God has come into the world. But we also have a message for the church in this age that we need to stand up for. And that is that a church today is seeking what Thomas wanted or it's seeking sight or it's seeking signs and wonders, right? You know what that's doing? It's actually trying to take away blessing from the church. It's actually trying to remove the blessing that Jesus gives here. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen, not seen visions of Jesus, not seen signs and wonders, not seen anything other than believe in the historical Jesus as he's revealed himself in history and given us all the evidence we need And people are trying to take away the blessing. Jesus promised blessing, eternal blessing. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And they want to take away that blessing. They're pursuing a destruction of that blessing. We've got to have sight. We've got to see things. We've got to see signs and wonders. The battle for faith alone is just as hot as ever in the church. And the story of the disciples' message is also a message for us as we go through times where things haven't worked out. That's where these guys were. That's where they were dejected, greatly disappointed that the Messiah didn't turn out to be that military. He's dead. And then then they were grief-stricken, remember? Doubts and fears. Maybe even thinking God has let them down. But it turns out that Jesus was actually there all along, just on the other side of the wall. Anybody gone through a hard time and thought, why is the Lord, where is he? Where is he helping me through this? Has he forgotten me? He was right there on the other side of the wall watching you all along, waiting to see if you will have faith in him. And the battle in the world, the message we've got for the world that's offering many ways, ways of spirituality or ways of fulfilment, ways of, of finding yourself, 
All kinds of ways being offered. When you find Jesus, you haven't just found the way. That's what Thomas said way back in chapter 11, 16. He said, Lord, show us the way. And when you find Jesus, you haven't just found the way. You found the way, but you haven't just found the way. You found the destination. You found God. That's where this gospel climaxes. My Lord and my God. Verse 31 is not just some academic record. Read it again with me. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Important implication there. If you haven't got faith in Jesus, you haven't yet got life. You know, uh, believing, people say, I, you know, I, I believe, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. Well, let me do the little joke that James in his epistle does when he says to his readers, do you believe in God? Put up your hand if you believe in God and everybody puts their hand up. Yes, I believe in God. And James says, that's good. So do the demons. The demons believe and tremble. So you believe in God? Excellent. So far you're only qualified to be a demon. It's not really going to take you too far. Okay. If you want to have life in his name, you have to swap over from just believing in God, God's out there, to believing in Jesus as my Lord and my God. Is Jesus not just God, but is he your Lord and your God? Do you have an actual relationship with Jesus, or is there some part of your life where you got the pink slip up and you're trying to squeeze him out of that part of your life where you can't say, in this area of my life, he is my Lord and my God. Those who have life in his name are those who bow the knee and hand over every part to be able to say, my Lord and my God. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed.